You're listening to The Dental Guys, episode 77. Good people can be great with Amy Morgan and Frank Spear. We sat down with Amy Morgan and Frank Spear at the recent Spear Summit, and Amy really taught us a lot about how to take your team members from good to great, and she also talked a lot about what it means to have a culture in your practice. We took a good hard look at how we hire for our team and how that core values really cannot be faked. It really challenged us to start to look inward in our practice. I think you'll understand a lot more about why Frank Spear has been so successful after listening to this episode of The Dental Guys. This episode of The Dental Guys is brought to you by the Dental Crafters Network, your implant restorative connection. From surgical planning to patient-specific guides, quality implants, and final restorations, the Dental Crafters Network provides one relationship with infinite possibilities. Call 1-800-472-8302 today. That's 1-800-472-8302. Do you want to be able to understand, place, restore, and implement dental implants into your practice? Well, we've got the course for you, Restorative Driven Implants, taught by the Dental Guys. Restorative Driven Implants is coming to Nashville in 2019. Head over to RestorativeDrivenImplants.com now to sign up. That's RestorativeDrivenImplants.com. Wes, I'll tell you, this last month has been awesome. And really one of the things that made it awesome was getting to spend some time with some incredibly talented people out at Spear Summit. I mean, what a trip that was. What an opportunity that was, huh? Man, we had a great time. Um, I, I think that from a content, uh, we call it a content rich environment, (laughs) (laughs) kind of like a target rich environment. Well, I think what they're trying to do and they're succeeding, uh, Spear Summit is becoming, uh, really one of those premier dental meetings where, you know, people can come and they're, they're going to, you know, see high level people. I oh, yeah. mean, it's it's unbelievable, and for us to be able to do like a post show or post lecture, uh, yeah. little interviews and and kind of just be yeah, able, it felt like we were doing Sports Center except I, it, with Frank Spear. It kind of was like that, you know, <laughs> Sports Center <laughs> with Frank Spear. And I mean, it, um, here we were getting to be, yeah, rubbing elbows with these people, you know, that we have really a lot of respect for mm-hmm. and uh, have, have followed a lot over the years, <clears throat> and to get that experience. Um, really personal experience one on one. Even this, if you weren't there interviewing them like we were, I mean, just getting to be there and see some of the lectures that that were there. I mean, yeah, you know, it was some of the best of the best. I think we, that they've had that they kind of brought all together. And it's not just awesome. Spear faculty that that speak; it's it's other people as well. And yep. um, you know, we were in and out of all the lectures with our you know interviews. A lot of that was going on while we were interviewing. And um, man, what a what a uh, what a place! It was awesome. And then there uh, was, was the then there was the costume party. Well, that then was there crazy. was that that was. <laughs> and that you know, let me tell you the sad part about this. Okay, oh, not, listen. so no, we have to talk about it. Yeah. Okay, man, do um, we? So we, I, I sadly we do. You know, so Wes and I, when we heard there's a costume party and the theme was heroes and villains, we were like, oh man, this is right up our alley. Because let me just tell you, Wes knows how to like, especially he's costume master. So. We both ordered costumes, and they were going to be amazing. Like, I was going to, I'll just tell you, I was going to be Thor. He was going to be Loki. It was perfect. And for whatever reason, the costumes didn't get there in time for the trip. So here we were. We show up at the thing, and they're all excited because we've been talking some junk, Wes. We've been talking some trash. talked some smack. About how good our costumes are going to look, and we had nothing. So we go to the costume party with nothing. Had our jacket sport coats on. Yeah, we just have our sport. Now, there were lots of other people there, though, but I mean, it was embarrassing. Hey, look, dude, they had the real Batmobile there. Like, I the know. one from the TV shows. Yeah. And there's a guy that, like drawing comics, like giant mur- oh. comic murals, and they there's like acting. live action they had, like, dancing. Acting. And I mean, it was, yeah. dude, it was a, it was a great party. And, and they, and, you know, we got amazing. to make some great kind of connections there. But, you know, I think definitely a meeting that uh, I look forward to going back to. Yep. Um, and one of the cool things we got from this that you guys are going to experience is 
you know, we got a lot of great interviews and, uh, yeah, a you know, lot of you... access to people that we may not ever have access to again, or, you know, we got introduced to and just being able to do it all there. Uh, it was really, really nice. Right. Uh, this particular interview that you're going to hear, um, is going to be, um, one that kind of, you know, challenges you from an interpersonal standpoint, how you interact, but it also shows you too why Frank Spear is Frank Spear. And mm. I mean, really it's a, it's a great uh, interview with Amy and we talk a lot about business and, yep. and, and how you need to be a good <clears throat> leader, but stay tuned after the show uh, for John and I, as we come back and we talk a little bit about uh, what you've just heard. Yeah, some uh, reaction to it. Some reaction to that. So, yeah. And before it's, we it's go good. into the episode, you know, I want to talk to you about. We want to talk to you about an exciting product that we've been using, and um, it was really cool. You know, Zerk uh, contacted us uh, about this product, saying, "Hey, you know, we want you guys to try this out for us and kind of talk about it. If you like it, talk about it on the show." And so we did. We uh, uh, we we tried this product out, and really, I want to tell you a little bit about it. So product is called Pink Petal, and that sounds a little weird. You know, what is Pink Petal? Well, it's basically, uh, it's something that allows you to hold a saliva ejector up against the patient's cheek. You know, Wes, you remember the days, I'm sure, before we had any kind of really good self-contained uh, suction well, listen, kind of devices. If, you're, where... if you were ever in dental school, if you were ever in dental school and you were listening <laughs> to this, yep. If you ever made it through dental school without the right. suction falling out of the patient's cheek and saliva drilling down the, the patient's, you know, we practice without assistance in dental school. But guess who right. still practices without assistance? Our yep. hygienist. And imagine taking a dry angle, okay, and yep. making it a, like a soft silicone dry angle and putting a little loop in it. Okay, yep. that's what pink pedal yeah is. so it it's, holds your saliva ejector in the mouth keeps mm -hmm. it where it needs to be up against the cheek and it creates just the perfect angle to where it you know again the, instead of your patient like holding the saliva ejector while your hygienist is doing scaling and replaning that you it holds it there for them and mm -hmm. it kind of also creates a little bit of cheek retraction too uh because of the the fact that it's up against that cheek it, it, but the main thing is it's allowing for that to stay right in the corner of the patient's mouth. <clears throat> right. So you get this kind of constant saliva ejection, which is really, really good for times when you need to use the ultrasonic, or the right. hygienist needs to, either, needs to use the ultrasonic without an assistant. So right. my hygienists have used this now for a couple of months, and they've really uh, put it through its paces. Uh, and the main time when they've told me that it's been really useful is when they've had a patient who couldn't tolerate Mr. Thirsty, okay? So right. some patients can't, we know that. Most patients can, but there's some patients that can't, or they just don't wanna get the whole thing out, they just need something kind of simple. Um, right. You know those patients that like, they every 10 seconds they're like, raise their hand, I just gotta swallow, I just gotta swallow. Just, can, you put, can you put the suction in there? Can you right, put the can you just put it in there? there? I just need to, you, I just and, need to put, and oh, so, hold on. Right, and so For the patients takes, that wanna talk, right? Yes. So right. it takes twice as long for those appointments. So right. the hygienist will grab this. It takes like one second to just curve the saliva ejector through this thing and put it in there. And and this patient now feels a lot more comfortable. They can use the ultrasonic because you know I don't know about you, Wes, but my hygienist we use ultrasonic. I think or piezo all the time. All the time. Yeah, and all you got to have water. So if if the patient can't tolerate a Mister Thirsty type of appliance, then you got to have some kind of alternative that's better than the patient holding their suction because there's just no way the hygienist can do that. I mean, Wes, what have, what have your hygienist said about it? Well, I think the same thing yours have said. We both kind of used this and didn't talk about it, but they said, yeah. you know, when they didn't want to get Mr. Thirsty out, it's this is just laying right there. And in fact, what they've been doing, these come 50 to a bag, okay? And so they go ahead and thread on the pink petal and just have them laying in the drawer. So it's on the suction. So they've got some suction tips with and without, and it just yep. is right there. And that's the thing about Zerk products. Um, their whole yep. kind of mantra is because time is everything. And being able right. to kind of just, hey, you just plug this on a saliva ejector with, with you know, the pink petal clips onto a, just a standard saliva, you know, suction tip. Right. And... You're ready to and, go. 
And the other thing too with this is a lot of their products just like this are disposable. Mm -hmm. So and the thing costs 50 cents. 50 cents. Basically. So you have 50 yeah. cents, you throw it away when you're done. It adds almost nothing. And I think it makes a big difference in I think it's how great. comfortable your patients will be. So you know, go go over there to berserk.com, check it out. Uh, Link and, in the description what you down think. below to Zerk and uh, check yeah, it out. Yeah, and you know, we may, I don't know, we'll see what happens. Maybe uh, we can get them to do a promo code or something. We'll let you guys know about that uh, because we do definitely like this product. We endorse this product. We think it, it's really something to check out. If you don't, uh, or if you know, if you don't want to do Mr. Thirsty or Isovac or Isolite or one of these things, check this out because this is a good alternative to kind of get you started uh, we think once you've tried this, you'll also want to try Mr. Thirsty too, because they're yep. both kind of in the same family, but they definitely serve a little different purpose for something that's quick, easy, uh, and, and inexpensive. So go over to Zerk.com, check it out. Uh, but uh, with that in mind, uh, we're looking forward to seeing what you guys think about this next interview. So without further ado, here is Amy Morgan and Frank Spear. Well, welcome to this post-lecture interview with uh, Amy Morgan, and we're so glad to also have Frank Spear uh, who needs no really introduction here, but I just want to tell you a little bit about Amy Morgan. Amy, who gave this wonderful lecture in here, which was amazing. If mm -hmm. you didn't get to see that, go back on the live broadcast. It is available right now on Spears' Facebook and the Dental Guys' Facebook page. But Amy is the CEO of Pride Institute, which is nationally acclaimed, result, results-oriented, practice management consulting company, Amy and her team of highly qualified consultants have revitalized thousands of dental practices using Pride's time-proven management systems, which result in dentists becoming more secure, efficient, and profitable. Thank it's a good you. intro. It's, it's a good intro. intro. I think it's a little yeah. bit. Of, yeah. Now, tell us a little bit about your history at Pride first, because I think that's pretty neat. Uh, that was such a great introduction. I'm just going to say ditto. But uh, <laughs> I, I I came to Pride 25 years ago, which makes me incredibly old, <laughs> and hopefully a little wiser. Uh, I started as a cash flow crisis consultant um, for Medical Dental, and uh, the the interesting thing was is that the dentist that I served at that point. The, their problems developed because of one bad week or one bad month, and it was just poor business skills. And so I started to look for courses that would educate them beyond their clinical excellence. And there was a course called Dentist is Entrepreneur, where they actually had to break out a profit and loss statement. And I just broke out in, you know, excitement. Uh, and it was a pride course. And I started to send the doctors there. And Dr. Pride met me and said, why do you wait till their hair is on fire? Um, how about you get to them before? And um, at that point, it was a perfect um, step for my career. Hmm. Started it as a consultant, became the CEO in 1998, <clears throat> and uh, in 2004, when Dr. Pride passed away, I took over as owner hmm. uh, with the intention to continue his legacy. And what's so very excited is that legacy is coming home to roost by uh, our joining of resources with this gentleman right next door to me. Yeah, tell us about that, Frank. What about Amy inspired you to bring her on? <laughs> well, this, this, it's actually a funny story, because and we, she and I have had this conversation just the last two days. Um, Jim Pryde approached me in 1993, 1994, about the concept of merging my teaching business with the Pride Institute. Hmm. And so Jim had a vision in the early to mid-90s um, that you know he could he could help dentists manage their practices and and become more profitable and manage teams and I could train people clinically but there was no place they could go where they could get both mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so we did about kind of two years together right around the 94 95 period where I went to California and did a bunch of courses for that at Pride he would come up to Seattle. He did some stuff with courses I was doing in Seattle. He and I actually traveled to Minnesota and did a course, Chicago and did a course. Ultimately, it just kind of wasn't the right time, I think, for me or Jim. So it sort of kind of just drifted mm. apart. Um, and then so it's so funny that here we are 23 years later. <laughs> mm. And, um, you know, I've, I've always held pride in such high esteem. I had such respect for Jim and everything that... that Pride believes in, like listening to you know that last hour. It's like 
you could have been talking, I mean, you, did, you couldn't say anything more clearly than you did about what my beliefs are about how, the, what the, what's important in managing dentists and teams. Mm. I mean, it's just, it's so we're special. totally, so totally aligned. Mm. Um, and when this sort of started about 18 months ago, I think was the very first kind of little whispers about, wow, we may be. Um, and you know, it percolated and percolated and, and then here we are today sitting next to each other on your podcast. Awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, I, I think that, that that really goes right into kind of what we want to talk about, which is kind of the merging together of uh, the clinical side and the business side. And you know, we certainly feel um, that it's both are extremely important. And I think that that is one of the things we find many times we hear about uh, business courses is it's about business, it's about business, it's about business. And, and the clinical excellence is often not discussed. And so they may, there may be some um, verbiage that's taught or some systems that are put in place, but then we're not taught that we actually have to back that up with excellent dentistry. And uh, you know, I think Wes and I, as we were hearing this lecture, we were just kind of struggling talking about, you know, we, we know there's sort of different, like your audience today, in general, we are probably dentists who have some clinical skills the audience in there yeah the audience here at the summit and and uh, so so they're at a point where hopefully they can back up uh, good uh, marketing you know if they market that they can back up their marketing um, I'd like to know how how do you approach this same topic of leadership uh, creating a vision creating uh, systems in your practice with someone that doesn't maybe have the clinical skills, say a, say a younger dentist, a newer dentist who is still, you know, what is the focus for that demographic, that age, that time when you're just trying to to pay the bills and, and get going in your practice versus, you know, as you get further along in your clinical skills? Uh, the first thing that you have to realize is that core values is what starts the whole thing. Uh, and you cannot fake this. You know, one of the very first things I did when I took over as owner at Pride is I wrote our vision statement for Pride. And I have a line that says we attract good people who want to better themselves and others. And that was controversial for my team because they wanted us to be great people, mm. right? Splendiferous people. And, and my whole concept is, is that not all great people are good, but all good people can be great. Right? Um, and to me, there's something called karmic capitalism, right? Okay. Yeah, I love people to be filthy, dirty, stinking rich, but I want them to be filthy, dirty, stinking rich because they earned it. And mm. so if you're a good person who recognizes that you're on a journey to become better and better as a clinician, that's, that's a step zero. Mm. Uh, I mean, just like anything, it's a process, it's a journey. Um, and, you know, and when you're honest and authentic about your level of expertise, either on the business side or the clinical side, um, then you can build and move forward. You don't have to be perfect to be successful, but you do have to be good. Mm. And that's, a, that, that's the, the point, I guess, in that is that it, these, these are ideas that transcend your clinical level of expertise. If you begin with this in mind that this is... Uh, you, you, you eventually can get to the point where you can do more and more and more of that. Uh, I think that a lot of our, our younger listeners and our demographics are interesting because we have a lot of older people that are getting involved with this as well, a lot of very more experienced dentists, but we have a lot of newer graduates, you know, that are asking the question of, you know, they, they know that they don't have business training. They realize that. And I think they focus a lot on, on business training because they they think that's what makes them in successful. spite of their clinical skills right 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 and so right. it's it's so i guess we we love the fact that that you guys are uh, coming at it from both sides that it does take both sides to make this work and and i think that that's something that is is tougher to get across maybe to someone who just feels like well if i just learn how to run a business then i'll be successful and that's something that we hear a lot well can i be very honest with you i know we're going to be talking about the e-myth in, in a yeah. few minutes, uh, if I, it, uh, whether they're cooked as dentists or not, clinicians graduate from dental school going, oh my gosh, I'm a dentist. And I, and, you know, and when you start to actually flesh out the e-myth roles, mm -hmm. um, I find that they have more comfort 
whether they're doing it right or not in the clinician role. Yes. The leader or manager. So uh, I, I was actually talking about this at, uh, at the prior day's workshop, is that if they had a choice between Invisalign certification and a course on leadership, uh, it's not going to be a surprise that there are 90% of them are going to head towards the Invisalign certification. Yeah. Because, so, well, and so, I think there's a big difference yeah. between leadership and business. And right. that's the thing I think that, that, that is so good to hear is it's business is what I think many are drawn to. Not necessarily it's leadership. They don't understand that, that part of it. But let's jump right into that EMF discussion. Such a great you know, we, we both had, had read this book years ago and it really challenged us. And if you haven't, and listeners, if you haven't read this book, uh, I think it's very important to maybe understand more about why we struggle with certain areas as far as our role. And basically to, to try to very much boil this down is the, myth, the, the book essentially says that the myth is that entrepreneurs uh, just have to work super hard and that's why they're successful. Rather than saying that we need to understand that we have limitations and we can't always do everything. And there are three main roles. There's the visionary, there's the manager, and there's the technician. And those are the three roles that the author kind of says, these are, we, you need all of these things. And that bo most people, according to the book, can do usually one very well, sometimes two, rarely three, uh, and so I guess what Wes and I are wondering about this is, you know, where do you see this fall in dentistry? We know, as you said, as you just said, many of us are good at the technical side. We're naturally drawn to that. Can dentists do two things well? Uh, can they do three things well? And how do they handle that if they realize that they can't do managing well or they can't, do they hire someone that can do that for them? Uh, do they uh, try to develop that skill in themselves? Well, it's interesting because part of the e-myth talks about the fatal assumption. Hmm. And the fatal assumption is if you understand the technical work of a business, then you are successful in that business that does the technical work. And in small business, the truth is, whether you're good at it or not, it is learnable, and you have to be able to function in all three roles. Mm. Because, of course, the bigger you get, you put infrastructure, you put management below you, you put team leaders below you, but somebody has to manage and lead the leaders. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that's going to fall to the small business owner. It, it, it's not a big business. And so, uh, so yes, you're going to have a natural propensity towards, uh, uh, towards one or two of those but it is learnable and you know a, a leadership has to come before management and uh, and honestly the clinician or the technician the very best small businesses um, are those that the owner is excellent at doing what that business represents and therefore never held hostage by a, a team that doesn't do it as well mm. so you do need to function in all three roles and and there is an order to it um, and when we teach this uh, to our, our dentists and dental teams, uh, what we always say that it can be feel like a schizophrenic moment. You mm. could be at a staff meeting and someone could say, why do we have no shows and cancellations? If you answer it as a leader, you're going to say, imagine if our patients valued their appointments so much that they never would consider canceling. The manager would say, what are the protocols? Did you check the ASAP lists? Um, can we move somebody up? The clinician would look around the room and say, what employee needs dentistry? Because anybody in the operatory is better than none. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, so as, you, as you learn your ability to be flexible enough to be able to, at any moment, answer from any of those three roles uh, is what makes true successful business owners as dentists. Does, mm. does that make sense? So you have a system of teaching, you said, certain levels. One thing you said, leadership has to come before management. So how do you create a leader out of a technician? Because mm. that, to me, is a conundrum that boggles the minds of a lot of CEOs. Yes, and, and we've struggled to can you do it? Yes, you can. Okay. But it is a deep metaphysical conundrum. <laughs> right. Yes. Yeah. So Ricardo Matrani, who is Spear faculty, was on the podcast earlier today, and he talked about one of the keys to being a, uh, 
acceptable or amenable to change is to being humble. And he made a comment that it's hard to change somebody that's not humble. And so the first thing he said is that you've got to have somebody that's willing to listen. Mm. And so if you have somebody that's willing to listen to, to be able to change and become a leader, what's what the first step in becoming a leader? What's your, what's your thoughts? Well, very often, yes, I agree about humility, but that also comes with maturity. Uh, you know, I was talking about many, many dentists think that they have to be the Wizard of Oz, the wizard, you know, in front of the the all-knowing, all-powerful, you know, in front of the curtain with with a a demeanor that's only one-dimensional because they have Is that the doctor mentality kind of thing? Or is that like they're looked to as the doctor with the white coat uh, now? uh, Yeah, it's, you know, technically that's called position power. Right. Right, you know, is that uh, if I hide behind my DDS or DMD, or I'm the owner and that's why, or the parental piece, uh, then you can be full of sound and fury signifying nothing, but mm. that's, that's empty, that's mm. empty. Uh, and the humility comes from, I mean, the definition of an emotionally intelligent leader is self-awareness before social awareness. Mm-hmm. And so the vulnerability of going, uh, I'm scared, or I don't know the answers, or I was wrong, or I need your help, is 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 an evolutionary step so i don't i don't hold out no hope for the the less than humble leader i know that somebody has to get behind the curtain and reveal who they really are but you find it sound is it true that that most the dentists that you're training are in this same place where they the technician is there but the, is it usually the, the leadership skills or the management skills they lack? Is it, it, again, leadership coming before management, but do you see that, that is, that's, that's the typical prototypical dentist that you work with, is you're having to bring out that leadership, that visionary side more than the managerial side? It goes 50-50, but okay. the really scary thing is that when you talk about practice management, which is why what we're doing here at Spear is gonna be so revolutionary, is that if 20% of the entire dental community even consider their management or leadership um, roles and, and, and their lack thereof, then, you're, then we're talking about a high percentage. There mm-hmm. is a good, solid, dominant percentage that wallow in their less than, than ideal success because they can. Because one of the things that's frustrating for me as a business consultant is that dentistry defies the rules of small business. You know, good economy, bad economy, for every 100 small businesses that open, 80 are out of business mm. that same year. Dentists can be relatively mediocre, unfortunately, either on the leadership and business side or the clinical <laughs> side, and they will limp along for an entire career making money that others would consider to be pretty darn good, mm-hmm. right? So so the analysis paralysis, the inertia mm. is is the biggest barrier. Um, once you're in, um, you know, there is, personality style does come into it. You can be a quiet leader, you can be a loud leader. Uh, uh, th- that um, th- It could be split 50-50. There are visionaries out there who overlead and undermanage, and there are managers out there that uh, overmanage and underlead. I happen to be a, a manager who underleads at times. Mm. I had to learn, but mm. I am a walking testimonial that it can be done. Yes, and so it's not, it sounds like what you're saying is many times, I mean, regardless of the personality type, that this is a this is trainable it's teachable and it's not it's not something where you need to hire someone necessarily in your office to take the place of that because we hear those types of things thrown around sometimes that well if you can't present treatment for instance you know if you don't have that skill that maybe you should you know have someone in your office who can um, versus learning how to present treatment or discuss that with patients. You, do, you, do you feel that that falls in with this or is there still a place for you know, trying to, to, if you realize your, your deficiencies, if you will, um, to finding people on the team that, that complement that? Well, 
I believe that you can hire your talent to mm -hmm. do the things that that you are an excellent at, but in a small business, be very careful. Mm. In fact, we were talking about this. Um, I think the hardest team member to lead is a truly, deeply committed enrolled employee, especially if the dentist owner is less enrolled. Mm. Because it, it, you know, it, when, when the team member wants it more than the leader owner, um, it balances the natural way that things need to be. And going all the way back to my cash flow crisis days, many embezzlements started out with, with a team member who felt more enrolled mm. than the leadership themselves mm. and, and, and saw the money that they took as, as they deserved it. Yeah, an entitlement. Mm -hmm. Right, and yeah. I'm not saying that enrolled employees <clears throat> embezzle. I'm saying that I think that there's an art form for staying in front, which is what leadership is all about, mm. the most invested employee because um, they still have to be led. Well, you know, uh, to give a basketball an analogy, some could say, since I'm a Warriors fan, <laughs> that uh, LeBron James uh, was more enrolled than his coach, mm. um, and he couldn't be the only person on the floor to actually win a championship. That they're, they're, you needed that management, you needed the coach, you needed the leader. So it's not just talent, it's, it's um, the flow of, of inspiration and focus. Does the owner have to be the leader? Uh, yeah, the, the owner has to have inherent leadership. Every single team member in the office has to be a leader into, on their own right. I mean, that's the self-directed team leader. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, the, the hygienists lead their <coughs> patients in pursuing ideal care. The associates have to lead their patients. The, the appointment coordinator needs to inspire somebody to want to keep that appointment. And certainly the financial coordinator needs to rise above insurance and mm -hmm. finance barriers. Mm -hmm. So I don't think there's any there's any position that doesn't have some sort of leadership and management mm -hmm. yeah. right that, and management yeah. organizations are flat and you know recently we've we've worked in our practices to kind of segregate certain divisions to and give the team managerial roles which took them away from me and we saw an uptick in case acceptance in those areas mm -hmm. because of ownership mm -hmm. inside right. of that division yeah. and whatever procedure it was. And, well, uh, and Frank, but, how do you, oh, go ahead. Well, I want to give one caveat to that. There is also an art and science to being great followers. Hmm, there, there's right. a, and, and part of, you know, Ken Blanchard always said, if you treat everybody equally, you're treating everybody unequally. Hmm. Um, the, you know, give me some solid, happy, genuine worker bees. Yes, yes. And let them be worker bees. Um, in their own right, um, you find your leaders, you find your leadership coalition for every single situation as they come, because what can happen is it's the Peter principle, right? Yes, absolutely, uh, yes. Just because you've got an amazing chairside assistant does not make her an ama or him an amazing team leader. So you have to use your talent wisely. Right. Yeah, you talked a lot about that uh, as far as looking at your team as your talent. I like that. Instead of just your team and how that would change the way that you treat them potentially. Talk a little bit about that. How, how do you feel, how does that change the way that you treat the people in your office? Well, l let's start at the lowest level, my staff. Oh, what, let's go even worse, my girls, which... <laughs> Right. We won't talk about that, yeah, right? Uh, yeah. uh, but I mean, uh, that that puts a separation, right, between mm -hmm. you know that that the, you know it, it almost creates a surf system, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm the feudal lord and or lady, and go out and till my fields, right? Uh, a team. You have to be careful with team because you, know, you can perceive a team as you know a, a herd of, of, of cattle, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Um, you know, uh, but I, you know, what I see is my favorite definition of a team is a group of individuals banded together towards a common vision and goals, right? So the individual is really important because nobody parks their soul in the parking lot mm. every day and comes to work for you, you know, without without that individual. Um, skill or talent. I think one step up is when you're actually hiring for talent. You know, the, just imagine that uh, the, you, we, you know, we were doing a, you know, I get to pick 
during trade deadlines, I want to poach this. Not that you're going to poach, no, but I you understand. get the idea. It's like I, I want Jimmy Garofalo for the uh, mm. Garofalo right. for the 49ers. Right. I, you know, that, that obviously I have a San Francisco bias. Yeah, I'm hearing My that. Apologies. Yeah. It's yeah. all right. I'm a San Francisco fan. But I'm coming to Arizona, so I apparently I'm going to love the Suns. Well, we'll we'll, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> but the the bottom line is is that when you choose talent. Mm-hmm. Um, there is an inherent respect and an inherent rep- appreciation for the fact that this person is here more for just the just the paycheck. They're here to actually contribute in a unique way, and Disney does that really well. Yeah, yeah. And Frank, I want to want to kind of bring you in on this uh, this part of the discussion too. Where do you feel that? Because I know again, partnering together w- on this is. Uh, I think super important and, and so unique it really is because it's the the clinical side of this of, of being excellent I feel is is so important here How, tell us talk a little bit about that you know where do you think the clinical skills and developing the clinical skills not only of the dentist but also of the team of the the other people in the office how does that factor into this leadership um, I'm actually gonna go I'm going to go back a little bit to something you were talking about earlier before I come back to that. Okay, okay. So when you were you were talking about young dentists and, you know, maybe they don't have the clinical skills and and there's there's an awareness that they if they could just if they could grow in how to run a business, their life would be better. Yeah. And and my the story I have about that is that when they say they need to learn how to to run a business, what the reason they're saying it is they're they're looking at results they don't like of how their business is running. Mm-hmm. So the challenge is, and I see this with with young people in particular who have a lot of debt, um, is they're focused on how do I get different results? Yes. Which means they're focusing on the results, which means they're not focusing on the process right. that leads to the results. Mm-hmm. And so what my comment would be when you talk about a young dentist needing to learn how to run a business, they need to learn what it looks like to run a business from a leadership management technical position because the tendency is to think that the technical side of it is what they're going to change. If I could if I could run a business and I could run my employees better, I'll get different results. Mm-hmm. And yet you can't run your employees that way. Mm. You, you can't. You, you will never get there with that. The day-to-day, damn it, why didn't you clean up the sink? And why did you leave the instruments on the tray? And, and for a lot of people, that's the level at which they're trying to, quote, manage their employees. Mm-hmm. That's, that's never going to get there. Yeah. I mean, ever. So for me, I think when we have, when we have the opportunity to impact younger people well frankly older people too <laughs> let's just uh, yeah. when we have when we have the ability to impact people who don't understand that a successful business has a structure to it and that structure does start with leadership and it does have management and then it does get to a technical level cuz somebody actually has to do the work <laughs> right mm-hmm. you just can't sit up here and talk about it all the time um that probably the beginning point for all of those, and I'll just use the young person because that's what you brought out, the beginning point is to make them aware of what they're not aware of. Mm. To me, nobody makes the decision to change until they're aware that there's a different way of looking at it. Yes. If, if you're aware that your, your finances suck, mm. then you just want a way to make your finances not suck. And if you think that pushing your employees to do something different or work differently is gonna be the way to get you there, it's not gonna get there. But if you can take that same person and say, hey, let me give you a vision. Mm. You want your employees to function in a different way? Let me give you a vision of how that works. Mm-hmm. You know, Let me give you a vision of what is it that takes, how, how do you create, and I love the word culture. To me, that's. And I've always used that word in my practice. Mm-hmm. We, we created a culture in the office. Every single person in my practice could tell you exactly what we were about. It, it, when a patient had an issue, I'm one of my favorite stories ever of a patient that came to my office was in the late 90s, mid 90s. And our office was very nice, is very nice. 
but I had just opened a new office in Seattle. You know, I had fireplace in the waiting room and glass artwork all over. And, and this person was referred by the dental school. And he was referred mm -hmm. by the dental school because they didn't feel like he, he was beyond what a dental student should be treating. You know, you, why do people go to the dental school? Why, why it's does, cheaper. It's cheaper. Right. right. Right? So he comes to my office. He walks in, Debbie, who's still with me today, she's been with me 32 years, Debbie was there at the front. He s walks in the front door, he looks around and he said, I think I'm in the wrong office. <laughs> mm. And Debbie says, are you Paul? And he says, well, yeah. She says, no, you're in, you're in the right office. Paul said, no, I don't think so. This looks like an office for wealthy people. Mm -hmm. It looked like an office for doctors and lawyers. This doesn't look like an office for me. <clears throat> and, you know, you think about how does an employee respond to that mm. if they don't understand the culture? That's mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. If they don't understand who you are as an office. And so Debbie's response to Paul was, you know, Paul, we do have doctors and lawyers and wealthy people as patients. We also have school teachers, mechanics, longshoremen. You see, you see, Paul, every patient that stays in our practice, they're here for the same reason. They have a desire to have the finest quality dentistry they can get in the most caring, comfortable environment possible. So if you're looking for the finest quality dentistry you can get in a really caring and comfortable environment, we are a perfect office for you. Yep. And she said, I would encourage you to stay and let Dr. Spear do the exam. I did. Now, that was back before digital photography, so he had to come back for a second visit because I had to get slides processed. We go through the whole thing. Debbie presents the fees. He says, you know what? Your treatment plan's more than I make in a year. And he said, I, I got to talk to my wife. And he left. That was on a Wednesday. The following Monday, he came back. He drove to the office. He wasn't appointed. He walks in the door and says to Debbie, I, I'd like to talk to Dr. Spear. Well, I was seeing patients, but I got up and walked up. And Paul says, you know, I think Debbie told you that your treatment plan's more than I make in a year. But he says, you know what? My wife and I, we have no kids. We're in our 50s. We're frugal. We've saved. I came here. I drove here today because I wanted you to know in person I'm doing treatment with you. Mm -hmm. It's mm. special. When you're... When your employees, when your team doesn't understand at that level why you exist, they can't respond to that. Yep. That's the culture. And, and that's the leadership. The leadership creates the culture where people go, wow, I'm so, it's so cool to be part of this office. Yeah. And you didn't even know that was going on. You know, I mean, you knew it was going on, but you didn't even, you weren't even yeah. a part of really what happened no. there. No, you no, no. You mentioned too that, oh, man. that the, your training to be able to learn how to create that vision as a leader, mm -hmm. you established what you wanted that office to be. That started with you. For mm -hmm. sure. And, and then it trickled down and your team had buy-in for that. And that creates an environment where a patient walks in and they want the mm -hmm. best yeah. and and that's what we're talking about here Absolutely. It's create the environment you're wanting to work in mm. and and when you do that you see the passion yep right yep. You, you see it and you feel it and the patients feel it and case acceptance is great and we're not talking about just doing full mouth reconstruction no. here no we're talking about just having fun Absolutely. Yep. Right. Just and creating so, that atmosphere where so, people want want to. I mean, be I got there. chills up my spine right now just hearing the story. Um, so I want to cry too because I'm a filler. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and I want to give dentistry away, and I can't. Mm. You know, I mean, I'm that guy. So you know? just to answer another question. So there's a reason that I mentioned Debbie. Um, Debbie came to work for me October fifteenth, nineteen eighty six. Since two weeks after she came to work for me, I have never presented a financial plan to a patient. Oh mm. man. Because I want to give it all away. Right. And yeah. Debbie yeah. Debbie totally sees the value in it. And so for me, Debbie is the right person to talk to the patients about money. My office manager right Cause, now cause is just really loving you hearing saying that. <laughs> <laughs> she came into the office yesterday or the day before and she's like, You just gave too much away. Right. 
Yeah. Well, every one of us, I mean, again, I, even in my role, uh, I teach how to ask for money. But in the, in the role of leader, to, uh, it is, uh, you know, my natural inclination would be I will help everybody, mm. you know, roll up my sleeves, let's just rock and roll. And, and when you have a team that's loyal, that believes in you, mm -hmm. believes in your vision, mm. doesn't sniff a hidden agenda, they will go a mile for you. They will protect you. They will, they will make sure you say, stay in your swim lane as well. Mm -hmm. That's know? why you said in your lecture in there, I wrote it down, was that your best customers are actually your team. Yes. yes. They have to buy it first. And, you know, this is what we're talking about right here really is just being genuine. And, and if you are genuine about your, your passion for doing excellent dentistry, and, and it's not just that, but it's just about having patients have a certain experience, yeah. a certain feel, a certain thing that they come out, just this was, a, this was different. This was something that makes me want to just be a part of what's going on there. It's, it's again, you mentioned Disney, and there are some real correlations here. It's not necessarily about buying a certain thing or accepting a certain treatment it's about you know the experience where they come away going you know this is just a place that i like to be i feel comfortable i feel heard i feel like this place is genuine yeah. Yeah. there's a, there was a story that i didn't get a chance to tell because we were a little limited today when we were talking about leadership without wax mm. which sounds a little kinky um, like wax for you. I mean, what does that mean? But um, there's a story I read years ago, and, and this is what I mean by authenticity, is that many, many years ago, it, during Roman times, we're going way back, um, the sculptors um, would work with their marble, and, um, and the artisans, if they were working and they were creating a marble bust of your aunt and her nose flew off, they thought that the marble was speaking to them hmm. and that the, the nose should be off. Um, they also had middle-class Walmart sculptors hmm. and they were trained that if Aunt Fanny's nose fell off, they would take the nose, put it in wax and stick it back on the sculpture. Hmm. So they went to the Senate, and this is true, you can Google it, but they went to the <laughs> Senate and they were able to petition that on their storefronts that they would be sculptors sinicera, hmm. which is sculptors without wax. Mm. And mm. part of the essential element of, of leadership is to be a leader sinicera, mm. a leader without wax. If, if you go into a staff meeting and your nose falls off, keep it off. If you're, if you're in with a new patient and, and they're saying something that compromises your vision, then you have to let them know, I understand how you feel this way and it compromises our vision, is that the whole idea, and it's very vulnerable, to be this way because once your nose is off everybody can see it mm. is that the great leaders present as they actually are mm. and, and that translates to the team it translates to everybody John maybe we should ask we've got a few more minutes we've got about 10 minutes left here in the conversation is one of the things that we we struggle with today is once we've let somebody you know basically bow out of the practice for whatever reason they just didn't work out or they moved on to a different career we we, we want to hire the right people the right talent mm -hmm. to add to the team and we I mean I just talked to a gentleman last week he knew I'd hired two hygienists he knew it took me six months and um, you know it took six months and we knew it could possibly take that long to find the right talent and we're 60 days in and we're all high five fives behind the scenes. The manager is high-fiving me right now. And all the team is like 100% behind those two team members. And so we're thinking, man, this is really great. And so this guy contacts me, he's a listener of our show. And he's like, Wes, do you have any extra resumes? And I don't, because I weeded out and I wouldn't recommend anyone that I wouldn't want because he has the kind of practice that, you know, that we want. So what do you have, some, some advice for bringing on new team. We have all the systems of Amy Morgan and Frank Spear in place, okay? And now you're going to hire somebody. How do you do that? Shall I, do you want me to take it? So it reminds me of, remember the old Charlie Tuna? 
commercial that only good tasting tuna get to be star kissed. <laughs> right? oh, wow. But you, yes. had to, you had to really admire oh. Charlie. He gave it a shot, right? <laughs> I mean, w when, when, you, when you have that palpable culture, yes. even the ones that don't fit desire to fit. Mm -hmm. Right. I mm -hmm. mean, that's that's part of it. So when when you, you talk to the dentists who are like, there is absolutely no talent out there and you just have to call it uh, as horse patootie because they're there. Mm. Right. Um, a good course fills itself a good, uh, pe you know, people should be lining up wanting to work for you. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and when we're talking about the tuna net, when we're referring to the knowledge, skills, abilities and attitudes, that you're looking at for that perfect puzzle piece that can complete or fulfill your team, um, you have to present that, whether it's indeed.com or whatever it is, you have to, you have, to have it liberally through your, your hiring process. Of course, everybody knows you hire for attitude and you train for skill, that's a no-brainer. Mm -hmm. uh, most clinicians interview clinically. Yes. Um, and we all know that if you lead with the behavioral questions, eventually you want to put that hygienist in the chair and see if she could scale sure. to the degree. But you want a co-pilot. You want you want someone who who has their own personal vision that wants to link their energy to yours. And you do want to hold out for the best. Um, when I read want ads, or when I talk to Dennis, or I listen in on interviews, their message is as as messy and murky as what I see on their websites when it comes to brand promise. So mm -hmm. so it's not surprising to me that they're not finding the people. So, I, you know, whenever we started looking for a new team member in the hygiene role, um, I posted a very interesting um, ad on uh, our social media outlets uh, in our town. And one of them accidentally went up to my personal page, which I rarely post on. And what happened was is that I embellished uh, that they say the good ones aren't hired yet, or, they're, or the good ones are, are not out there anymore. And I embellished the profession of hygiene in my office. And I got a little kickback on that from some people in the profession, that I had embellished or made uh, the position more than it really was. But my culture is special, and it is I mean, yes. you work in our place. I yeah, mean, I, I'm not I'm just, just thinking about it's not it right just now. punching a clock. It's and, not just punching a clock. And I, and I think what you're saying is that you, you, you should feel free to express that and to tell people this is what we're about. And if, and if somebody feels that that's more I mean, I than what they want, that, that. yeah, yeah, you should embrace that. It sounds like that's, that's the key is being very comfortable I took, with I took that. it down off of my personal page, but I left it up in the other areas because the comments on it were a little bit harsh. Mm. And I didn't want people to read that because I'm proud mm -hmm. of the culture that I've created. Yeah, it's a and, good thing. And it's a good thing. And I'm passionate about it. And it really does start with leadership. Everything rises and falls on leadership. Absolutely. And as an owner, the hardest thing as a dentist is not to forsake your technical abilities for learning leadership because we want to be good technically because mm -hmm. we're fixers. Mm -hmm. But I think what we've learned today is that this marriage that you guys have created per se mm -hmm. okay is perfect and that you can come to spear education i sound like an advertisement here I'm, they're not paying me to say this no. but you can come to spear education and you can learn how to do the dentistry right and you, well and, and talk about it. i mean rather than us talking okay, about yeah, it you know right. talk about how is how is this going to work right you know i mean so you you've obviously <coughs> we know that this is a you know you guys are going to be working together uh, how, how, what is that going to look like? You know, what does that mean as far as how Spear and Pride are, are, are interacting with this? And what, what is that going to mean for somebody that comes and says, well, I want this? You know, what, what, do, they, what do they get? Mm -hmm. How does it work? Tell us a little bit about that. Uh, here's what I know so far is that, first of all, it needs to be very clear that Spear's already gone down the path. I'm just hitching a ride to add, you know, that Spear Practice Solutions has, has already content and a dashboard that I just get down on my knees and say we're not worthy. Mm. Um, the, the resources and the, the, the 18 year, month um, intention has already built a bridge between Pride and Spear for 
the best practice, the best possible solution. So, uh, and 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 honestly, from an evolutionary point of view, uh, the results that they're already getting are pretty pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. Um, as 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 pride becomes part of this, and and we are already having that happen, we're 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 very systematically bringing over the rich content that we have created over the years, um, both in training and in consulting, to add to what's already successful, mm. um, so that there is a one-two punch. Uh, I, not only am I coming over, and I'm coming over full tilt boogie, um, <laughs> uh, because uh, I'm interested in, in enhancing and supporting the practice consultants, um, as, as because each one of them are invested deeply mm. in in both the, their doctors and their teams and the success that they have, um, utilizing the dashboard and the tools that are already here to actually get more results, and of course then lending my skills as a trainer and consultant to 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 even deepen that learning. I'm also very excited that. Um, four of our consultants are coming over. Hmm. Um, Dr. Maria Ashley, Dr. Marsha Mullet, Dr. Wayne Purnell, and Mary Lynn Wheaton, and, and they've all, um, th two of them are dentists, one of them's a clinical psychologist, so, uh, so we, we can marry that. Um, and that they have, uh, th their average has been with us for 10 to 20 plus years. Wow. And they're very excited to become part of the team, learn the amazing um, new skills that that the practice solutions folks have created and contribute ours. So it's going to be the sum of the whole is greater than its parts. It's amazing, and I think that you all will, from what I hear, identify in the practice solutions when a doctor needs to pursue some technical education. And speak speak to that, Frank, as we're closing out here in the next minute. Well, or two. I, you know, I think the. If you really look at how this functions, um, it goes back to probably 25 years ago when I was working with Brian uh, with my office, and I was also teaching, mm -hmm. and, and we were creating clarity around the teaching business at the time, about what was the vision for me of the teaching business, what, were the, what was the mission of the teaching business, what were the values the teaching business operated under. And we really came down to which we hold on to today that's spear from you know 10 years ago when I came from Seattle with the business in Seattle and came down here we really are about trying to accomplish four things for our students number one thing is we want them to have more fun number two thing we want to be more profitable number three thing we want to have them have more time off and number four we want to help them grow clinically and you know, traditionally, the way we accomplish those things prior to practice solutions, prior mm -hmm. to this, is we accomplish them clinically. Mm -hmm. We can make you technically more proficient. We can make you more efficient. We can teach you how to treat and plan. We can teach you how to see what's in a patient's mouth differently than you ever have. We can teach you how to talk to patients differently. And consequently, the outcomes, the more fun, dentists love it when they get to do more kind of a fun dentistry. Mm -hmm. um, if you learn how to charge for it and be efficient at it, you're more profitable doing it. Um, if you have that practice, you tend to not have as many like emergencies and, and mm -hmm. you know, you, so you end up with more time off. Practice solutions was brought in as the missing link because what we didn't have was we didn't have the ability to improve the quality of the efficiency and operations of the office. Mm -hmm. And honestly, what motivated practice solutions was corporate dentistry. Mm. We, we saw what was happening with yeah. corporate dentistry and we saw how efficient corporate dentistry was running practices. Mm -hmm. And whether I had agreed with some of it or didn't agree with it or whether, you know, there's some good ones, there's some not so good ones. But, you know, we're about really, if you look at what we're about, we're about two primary things in terms of our, our overriding beliefs. We're about interdisciplinary dentistry, teamwork, that's why our study clubs are so important, and we're about independent private practitioners. Mm -hmm. Th those are our clients. In interdisciplinary dentistry, independent private practitioners. Practice Solutions was created so we could bring 
some of the, the advantages of the operations that corporate dentistry has and does well, we could put it into independent private practices. Yeah. Yeah. And so yeah. really the marriage now of, of pride and spear is, what it is is it's a massive enhancement to practice solutions. Mm -hmm. So that now we've got the ability to take all that content, we've, we've got Amy, we've got the other consultants, and so we can now provide for dentists um, you know, a, a, a much bigger and, and better platform to enhance the, the operations of their practice. Yeah. And for sure, part of that is that some, you know, we have some dentists that manage their offices really well. Mm -hmm. they, they wouldn't necessarily be a good candidate for practice solutions, but they may be a great candidate, in fact, because of, for clinical courses. Right. We have other practices that have done a lot of clinical dentistry um, and, and are really proficient clinically, but they honestly don't know how to run a business. Right. That's the perfect person that needs to go talk to Amy and see what practice solutions can do for their business side. Mm. And so it's, a, it's really, where are you in your practice? A lot of people, I would actually say most people, would benefit from both sides of our equation. No. Some, depending on how long you've been doing what you've been doing and how well you run your business, might only benefit from one side or the other. Well, I but think, and I think too, this comes back to what I've heard you say many times with treatment planning, which is, you know, you can only treat what you see. Right. And it's a similar thing with the business. Is uh, it's, it's really like a patient, right? it, you, you can only fix what you what you can see. Right. And right. if you don't, you mentioned before, if all you know is the results aren't good, but you don't actually have somebody who can dig into that and see what what the systems are what the what the real process basically do are. the initial six of the practice right it's assess exactly. the, and create an awareness yeah. in the client yep. yeah it really falls right with the treatment planning philosophy yeah. mm -hmm. okay let's find out what don't we know because we can't fix it if we don't know what it is and then develop the same kind of systematic approach to the business side the leadership side I mean it, it's a it's pretty neat to see that coming together you know and we're we're excited to we're excited to be to, to kind of just hear about this and to really be here for, you know, kind of hearing this coming together, you know, right right from the, the podium. It's pretty awesome. It's pretty awesome. Yeah. I think, you know, I'll close this out and say, one, we appreciate both Amy Morgan and Frank Spear for coming on today mm -hmm. and talking to the Spear audience and the Dental Guys audience because uh, this is what it's all about. It's mm -hmm. all about never stop learning right, right. it's our hashtag that's today, for right? today that's yeah. right never stop learning never stop learning is our hashtag today and and if you have questions for um amy or frank just send them to us yeah, um, we'll see it, if we can get it we'll to see them. if we can get them to them if, if you're interested in knowing more about what they're talking about at spear education with practice solutions you need to just head on over to their website and check it out mm -hmm. and uh, contact somebody there because uh, what John and I know about Spear Education is they're all going to try to take it to the next level, as mm -hmm. John and I say, uh, on our podcast. And so um, for Amy, Frank, and John, I'm Wes, and this has been a live broadcast here at Spear Education in Scottsdale. Thank you. Well, Wes, that was, uh, that was some pretty heavy stuff. You know, I, I, I really was kind of touched, to be honest with you, by Dr. Spear, by Frank's emotional side coming out during that you know talking about you could tell how passionately he he felt about his patience about mm -hmm. being uh not just the best in terms of doing the best dentistry but but wanting to really offer people the very best that's possible you can mm -hmm. totally see why he was as successful as he as he is because of that passion that humility but there were some interesting things I thought that uh, Amy said that really challenged well, me. I mean, John, I what did you that, take out of that? Well, you know, I agree with what you said about Frank. It just seems like he's an amazing storyteller and has so many stories. Uh, during this whole conference, every time we had him on, he told some great just stories. I mean, you I just want to grab a cup of coffee and sit <laughs> yeah. down and like eat some scones and and just talk to this guy, yeah. you know, or throw a steak yeah. on and stand by the grill and just listen to him tell stories <laughs> all day long. Exactly. You know, but i tell you what about Amy um, is that she is an extremely positive person and positive yes. people make positive, make a positive difference in people's lives. There are people that you want to be around all the time because you, they just feel good. You know, John, she came up to us maybe two or three times after we interviewed her, just to say hi 
and thank you. And man, you know, that kind of person, a nice person, is a person you just know is producing results. And one thing that she kind of said that kind of hit home with both John and I is that she said every owner can be or needs to be a leader. Yeah, and that was a real challenge, I think, when she said it, because, you know, what I was kind of trying to lead her to tell us more about is, you know, whether she felt, because we we see so many people that are not leading, Mm -hmm. and, I mean, we've all been guilty of that. It's not like we're great leaders all the time. I mean, we, we've all, Wes and I, we've got room to improve, everybody, right? We've failed. We've, we've learned a lot and we've sometimes not led how we should, but we just, I don't know. We meet people sometimes that are in dental practice ownership and we go, man, they're just not cut out to be a leader. Or maybe <clears throat> it's somebody who's not an owner and you think, wow, they really don't need to be an owner because they can't lead. Yeah. And she seemed to think you can develop that in everyone. What's her special sauce? I mean, I, it makes me want to go listen, like become a customer. Well, you know, I'm serious. Because like, I thought about that today as I was recapping this episode because it's been about a month since we went there. And I thought, man, I just like yeah. to get like a little inside taste of like what yeah. her. I'd love personal... to see her take somebody. I know. And take somebody who's, who's, who's just, you know, not maybe that personality type, quote unquote, because we tried to kind of ask her, like, are certain personality types just not, you know, good at leadership? Because I think a lot of corporate training that I've seen, at least that I've read in books, and so how knowledgeable am I? I'm not very knowledgeable. But, you know, you read about it, and it seems to be that there's certain personalities that fit better with with naturally leading, mm-hmm. um, and it, it, but there are obviously some things you can develop. Uh, so I wish I could see her in action. Yeah, it'd be amazing. You know, I think one thing else too, and this is just kind of a side comment, maybe just a little little something like maybe we should talk about sometimes, <laughs> is you get out of dental school and and your comfort, like they were talking about, is it, it always starts in the clinical. That's where you're most comfortable. Yeah. So like she said, you're going to automatically, if they offer a course on Invisalign versus business leadership, you're going to take the course on Invisalign because you're more comfortable in that role. And so what happens is, is that as we lose mentorship amongst our current 60 mm. to 70 year old dentist, maybe even 50s, 50 year olds, but I would say more 60 and 70 year olds, my dad's age, is that I feel like that DSOs are sweeping in and mm-hmm. replacing the leadership that we should be having as owners. Is that a problem? I don't know. I'm concerned yeah. a little bit because I believe in the private practice <clears throat> mantra. I mean, look, we have small, we have a profession here that where literally no, rarely do you ever see a dentist fail at business. Yeah. You know, they may not have as much income, you know, they have income potential, but they could have produced more. But honestly, every dentist that I've ever met has made a pretty decent living and, and, right. and does, fan, does just fine. But the yep. but they have a great potential, and it seems like maybe that it's like the sharks sweeping in, you know, and yep. and taking and taking. I, I think you're right, and I think that the way to, you know, to fight back against that, and 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 not that you have to fight back, but it's a way to a way to to kind of battle back against this this um, taking over, if you will in some ways is, is to be, is to learn how to lead the way that, yep. you know, corporate has taught uh, people to lead, you know, that the DSOs fill that void because it's uh, kind of the easy mode, you yep. know, it's like, well, let's, we'll give you kind of built in leadership and right. built in direction. And I think that makes us maybe hopefully that challenges us in the private practice world to say, well, you know, we need to develop ourselves as leaders. We need to develop the next generation as leaders as well so that we can um, have that presence that we believe in that that small business, private practice, do the right thing for your patient mindset and developing our teams through leadership. So yes. I agree with you, Wes. You know, I think that um, it's a challenge that Very we have to so. face. And I, I really <laughs> was personally challenged by it as well um, to, to just become a better leader and, and maybe to maybe to have more more faith in some of the people that I, I don't necessarily uh, believe can become leaders. Maybe they can. Right. And uh, so I, I, you know, I think we should, if you're, if you're 
I certainly feel like after talking with her that she's doing it the right way. Yep. Well, listen, this is just the beginning of some of the most amazing content that we've ever brought you yeah. uh, on The Dental Guys. In the coming weeks, we're going to release uh, bonus content. We're going to be releasing. That means that you're going to have extra episodes released on the off oh, week. You guys know we extra, listen. Extra, extra. Uh, we, we release uh, an episode every other Tuesday. We've been doing that for the past two or three years consistently. Uh, episode 79 is just around the corner. This is 77. And if you're really just excited about the dental guys, we need you to share about it on Facebook. That's how people find out about us. We don't advertise. Uh, we we kind of do this. We've grown this show organically, and we've been just so thankful for everybody that's listened to us. Hey, like us on Facebook. Share 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 a friend. Share, share to a friend something about the dental guys and maybe what they've done for you. Um, and hey, send us a message. Uh, we try to respond yep. to everyone. It's, it's, it's impossible. One of the things uh, that we also are on is we're on Twitter. And, and recently, uh, we just joined uh, Instagram. Right. We're getting and, younger. And we're getting younger. <sighs> and, um, and I tell you what, I'm, I'm, so far I'm satisfied. We're very careful. <laughs> yeah, and so, um, but I guys, I want you to. We got to give the, some credit to Carson out there. At, yeah, uh, shout out to for Carson for listening too, to this. So thanks. Uh, thank you so much for <laughs> helping us with our Instagram account. And uh, yeah. hey, listen, thank you so much for uh, subscribing to the Dental Guys, and uh, for more great content like this. Stay tuned because it's coming. So for John, oh yeah, I'm Wes, and we are the Dental Guys. <laughs>